studied verse 39 of chapter 3 last Sunday. These verses, as I said last Sunday, deal with a vital problem in human society, the origin of crime. Where from crime originates in a society? In seven verses, Krishna expounds this subject in this last section of chapter 3. The question Arjuna asked, how does man commit crime or sin? What impels him to do so? Often against his own desire or wish, what is the nature of that impulsion? And the answer came, in the human mind there are these two evil forces which can be made good also but under discipline, namely karma and krodha, craving and anger. These two are the products of the rajas aspect of our nature. The whole of nature consists of three gunas or forces, sattva, rajas and tamas. In this human being, when rajas and tamas predominate, then all these problems arise. As soon as the mind rises to the level of sattva, the whole aspect changes. Man becomes calm, steady, peaceful, compassionate. No crime can come from that state of mind. So he had already told us in several verses, this kind of origination of crime or sin from rajas and tamas actuating Kama and Krodha. I had also said these are only two out of six enemies of man according to Vedanta. I enumerated them last time Kama, Krodha, Lobha, Greed, Moha, Delusion, Mother, Arrogance and Pride, Matsatya, Proneness to fight, quarreling and fighting and violence. These are the six enemies of man. We have to tackle them if we have to have a healthy social order. We want a peaceful social order, peaceful interhuman relations. How do we achieve it? By each one handling the mind. Everything is in the mind. If you are of a healthy mind, all you do will be healthy. If you are an unhealthy mind, whatever you do will create tension in yourself, tension in society. So he said in verse 39, which we studied last Sunday, Avrutam jnana metera jnanino nitya vairina kama rupena kaunteya dushpurena anilena cha this karma and krodha hide our ever-present knowledge, our discrimination, our knowledge. First, these two forces hide that knowledge. Avrutam jnana metena. Suppose I am a fine person. When I commit a crime, at that moment, my knowledge of my identity, my status, all that is hidden from me for the time being. Kama and Krotha hiding the knowledge that is within me of my own status, my own nature, etc. Avrutam jnana metena. Vedanta always emphasizes this point. Man is essentially divine. These forces hide the divine. Just like the sun is always luminous. But a patch of cloud can cover the sun. 
and the sun becomes dark for us. Similarly, this divine nature and the knowledge of it becomes hidden by, by the overwhelming nature of this Kama and Krodha. Avrutam jnana metena. Jnani no nitya vairina. The jnani's eternal enemy is this Kama and Krodha. It is out of this every other evil will come. We have to handle this particular system. So last Sunday I referred to problems arising from unchecked desire, unchecked craving, what you call the consumerism of modern period. How much of destruction of nature is going on by that kind of consumerist philosophy. And crime in society, violence in society, go and trace them, you will find coming from this impulsion within the mind of man. So he says here, Avrutam jnana metena, jnani no nitya vairina, eternal enemy of man, of the jnani, the man of knowledge. The animals do not find it as an enemy. Man seeks knowledge. And because you seek knowledge, you have to train your mind. In that training, this becomes very important. Overcoming the forces of karma that impel you to do things which in a normal mood you will never do. So, this particular expression, jnani no nitya vairina, these are our eternal enemies. We are in search of knowledge, knowledge, physical, knowledge, spiritual. Both are knowledge to us, both are sacred. Man's pursuit of knowledge will be impeded, obstructed by undisciplined karma and krodha. I said last Sunday, discipline, karma and krodha are welcome. They have a place in human life. As I said, quoting Manu and krodha are welcome. They have a place in human life. As I said, quoting Manu, the great Manusmriti, you cannot act without the impulsion of karma. Karma is needed. And in our country, we want our people to have some karma because they are absolutely half dead. They have no desire at all. We want to make them desire for a better life, better sanitation, better education, etc. So, Agamasya Kriya Nasti said Manu. A man without desire has no action. What impels me to act is desire. So that desire is essential. All culture and civilization are the product of man's desire. But the same desire becomes disciplined when you become a civilized individual. In all culture and civilization, there is both the presence of desire and the disciplining of that desire. Society itself is a discipline of desire. I can't do what does harm to somebody else. There is civil law, there is criminal law, there is the state, and there is my moral conscience. All these are there to discipline this powerful force within man, desire. That desire is the eternal enemy of man when it is not checked and disciplined properly. Your whole life becomes a waste because of this. Jnani no nitya vairina, kama rupena kaunteya. What is that that hides this jnana? This thing called kama. That force called kama. Kama rupena kaunteya. What is its nature? Dushpurena anilena cha. It is like a fire which is very greedy. The more you feed fuel into the fire, the more fire inflames. That is the nature of this desire. Let me satisfy this. One, you will satisfy. Ten will rise in that place. And the whole of world's literature is full of instances of unchecked desire, raising many new desires and creating tragedies in life all over. 
So that expression is so beautiful. Dushpurena anale nacha, like fire in the Srimad Bhagavatam, the story of Yayati is there, the emperor. There this sentence comes there. He had tremendous desire to live a pleasant life, happy life, a worldly life. He did it. He became old. He wanted to become young once again. Asked his son for his youth. One of the sons gave back his youth to him. Again he continued. Then again he became old. Then he began to think a little. The body has become old a second time. The desire is still fresh, like a young boy. Desire has not become old. It is always fresh. I want one more round, that attitude. So a little thoughtfulness came to him sitting like this. Then he pronounced a great piece of wisdom in a beautiful verse. Najatu kama kama naam upabhogena shamyati habisha krishnavatmeva bhoya eva abhivardhate Desire is not quenched by satisfactions of desire. It only inflames like butter poured into fire. That is the language. This was a profound wisdom that came to us very early in our history. Today the world is seeking for that wisdom. Today's civilization is suffering from the same problem. Simply craving for new things, new gadgets going on without any limit and that destroys the resources of nature, creating ecological problems and difficulties. There is nothing higher. That is where this teaching comes. We don't merely say control your desire. We say divert it to something higher. The sensory craving is not the highest state of man. Sensory experiences are not the highest state of man. There is something higher still. So, Vedanta doesn't merely say control your cravings, restrain your desires, not at all. That will make you a killjoy, an ascetic, dry person. But Vedanta says there are other heights to conquer. Don't get stuck up at this particular level. Today's civilization is seeking for that wisdom. So this Yayati's wisdom is echoed in much of modern writing on the subject of the problems of modern civilization. Na jatu kama kama naam. Jatu means never. Never is kama satisfied through enjoyment of kama. It only multiplies. Just like fire in flames when you try to put it out by butter. That is the wisdom that finds expression in many modern writings. I sometimes quote a sentence from a commission's report in the United States just after the Second World War. A commission appointed to study the recent economic trends in the United States. There is a commission. In that report occurs this sentence. It echoes what Ayati said ages ago in India. The commissioners say, this study has revealed that human desires are endless. First sentence. And second sentence says that there are no new desires which will not give way to newer desires as soon as they are satisfied. That's the nature of the human mind. So what shall I do? Shall I go on in the world of desire, flow in the current of desire? No. That wisdom has yet to come to modern thinking. That second part, the positive part, is given in this Bhagavad Gita discourse as well as in all our Vedantic literature. You have to take your energies to a higher level of development. This kind of teaching 
which is founded here in these remaining verses, is slowly coming to modern scientific thought, especially bi biology and neurology. Then biology will tell you that organic satisfaction is not the goal of human evolution. That is the goal of pre-human evolution. That one sentence is enough to tell us that modern biology is in the right direction, that in a pre-human phase, evolution emphasized three things, organic satisfaction, numerical increase, and organic survival. Today's biology says these are secondary at the human level. Primary is something else. And what is that? Fulfillment. Are you fulfilled? If you are to achieve that fulfillment, you will have to do many things which earlier biology never understood at all. We have to achieve a new type of evolution beyond the organic dimension is the language. Organic evolution has brought us up to this level. It has given us the most versatile organ, the cerebral system. With the help of this, you can create any organs you like, just like creating the aeroplane instead of trying to develop two wings on your body. Your brain is useful for creating organs. So if organic evolution has no particular relevance at the human level, what exactly is the trend of evolution? To that question, Sir Julian Huxley gave a reply in his address to the Chicago Congress of Scientists in 1959, celebrating Darwin's centenary. He said, evolution has risen the organic, the psychosocial level. This psyche must be able to expand beyond this organic system and dig affections in other psyches in society. That is love. That is compassion. That is humanist concern. You grow spiritually thereby. This is a wonderful idea. So, today's biology is slowly giving us a positive direction to human energy, not merely a negative, which is the central theme of Vedanta. How to take this man to the highest possibility he is capable of? We develop a science of human possibilities. And this is a phrase coined by that very Sir Julian Huxley. Today we need a new science, he said. He calls it a science of human possibilities to take man to that highest level of evolution. Guidance of that science is needed. When you study Vedanta, when you study the Gita, you find there exactly that science, the science of human possibilities. Take, for example, hatred. We can overcome hatred. That's a human possibility. Hatred also is a human possibility. But controlling hatred also is a human possibility. Similarly, desire, craving, that's a human possibility. Controlling it, carrying its energies to higher levels, also is a human possibility. So Vedanta developed a science of human possibilities ages ago. These few verses are the offshoot of that science. What does that science say on this particular question of crime in society? How shall we reduce crime? One method we all have, increase the police force, pass laws and regulations in parliament. That's what we do all the time. But today we realize that it is absolutely incapable of achieving the result. Man cannot be made moral by an act of parliament. That's a great lesson we have to learn. There is such a thing as a human growth. Education is meant to make us decent citizens who can live at peace with other citizens in society. That doesn't come from an act of parliament. It comes from education. And education actually means, in the language of Vivekananda, manifestation of the perfection already in man. We are unfolding those beautiful possibilities hidden within 
ourselves so that peacefulness, humanist concern, a spirit of dedication and service, all these can come from within ourselves if only we know how to handle this wonderful thing called the human mind. All education is therefore training of the mind. All education, not stuffing of the brain, but training of the mind. Nowhere in the world today is education training of the mind. Mostly it is stuffing of the brain. And ours is the worst from that point of view. So these lessons from the Gita, from this great master teacher, Sri Krishna, we need very much today. We have the most untrained minds in India. A little discipline we are lacking in our minds. I often complain when you have a class of people sitting in for hearing a talk, if a crow flies across the hall, everybody looks to the crow and forgetting the speaker. Because there is no training of the mind at all. I am here to listen to the speech. How can a crow take my mind away? See, imagine the power of the crow. I am powerless before a crow flying across the hall. I have not controlled my mind. But when I address a set of girls, thousand girls, in the Tsurumi Women's College in Japan, near Tokyo. I saw them sitting absolutely steady, looking at a speaker, never looking this side and that side at all. They have been given a training, the Zen training, which has spread throughout Japan, has done a tremendous service in this way, training the mind. We have done nothing. Even our temples, we don't go to train our minds. We go there to chatter, to shout, to do everything. The training of the mind is not there. From now onwards, as Swami Vivekananda has taught us, we have both first emphasis on the training of the mind. You went to the temple, did you train your mind? Could you compose yourself there, calm, steady? In this way, the whole of life becomes training of the mind. When you train the mind, you are the master. If you don't train the mind, you become a slave. And when you have become a criminal, you have become a slave of your own basal instincts. You have not trained your mind at all. So this subject of training the mind is not merely meant for school students and college students. Every citizen in every field of life must be busy with his one work, how to train this mind so that the best possibility hidden must be able to manifest through the mind. It comes only through training, refining. All these are beautiful words in English language. So, this sentence Krishna said, Kama rupena kaunteya dushpurena analena cha. When I begin to understand my mind and its functionings, I come across these forces acting in me. There is no devil coming to trouble me. The devil is inside me only. That's why in our literature there is no place for the devil. You are the devil within. You must be able to control it, direct it. This is why training the mind is most important for everyone. Shankaracharya's statement in the Viveka Chudamani. Zaitan manashyodhanam karyam prayatnena mumukshuna those who want to be free, if you want to have freedom of spirit, you must train your mind. By great effort, prayatnena, it's not easy, prayatnena mumukshuna, vishuddhe sati jayatasmin mukti karapalavayate. When the mind is pure, freedom becomes like a fruit in the palm of one's hand. So palpable, so you can feel it. Yes, I am free, I am free. How? The mind is trained, the mind is pure. Freedom which is my birthright, I have got it today. Till now it was not there. So therefore, this energy of rajas and tamas, which motivate the mind towards karma and krodha, that energy has to be transformed into sattva. I have to do it myself. Nobody else can do it for me. 
a boy of 12 parents can advise that boy but work he has to do himself nobody can train his mind he has to train his mind himself so this is how parents must tell children i can help you but train your mind yourself there is a constant process of training the mind in work in leisure in human association everywhere you are training this mind silently quietly provided we know the science and technique of it and the need of it that's what is lacking today we don't know the need of it we just go at long whatever the mind says i do and what does the mind say mind says whatever the sense organs say mind is a servant of the sense organ of this body so ultimate dictate come from the sense organ and krishna will tell a verse or two later all these things in clear language so kama roopena kaunteya dushpurena anilena cha like fire which is very greedy you can't put out fire by putting more fuel on it pouring oil on it or ghee on it not at all there is another way to do it this mind also has to be handled in the same way and so in the next verse verse 40 krishna tells us where are these evil forces functioning within the system where is your enemy if you want to attack your enemy you must know his location that's the language just like a general showing go and take that fort very strategic fort then you will be able to win the war similarly krishna is telling arjuna and you and i that you and me that here are the centers where the enemy is functioning you can attack the enemy there what are those centers in verse 40 krishna gives you the direction indriyani mano buddhi yes tasya adhisthanam uchyate etair vimohayatyesha jnanam avartya dehinam indriya manas buddhi these three factors the human personality they are the centers where this infection takes place just like in medical science you will say what is the focus of infection then we can put something to remove that toxin and bring health so within this human system crime and many other evils in society proceeding from the mind but where exactly is the location of this enemy these various enemies and krishna says three locations are there first is this physical body that does no harm but the body is animated by one system called the sensory system the nervous system called the sensory system sense organs that is the first point to be considered as a focus of infection from which all these evils come second is mind manas indriya manas that is a psyche that also becomes infected in course of time if you don't take care and lastly the buddhi the intellect discriminative faculty what is right what is wrong what the buddhi gives you is that knowledge that buddhi also becomes infected it is then that we come to do all sorts of evil in society beginning from the senses to the manas to buddhi it is buddhi ultimately that destroys our life when it is thoroughly infected if it is not infected it can save us also so we have to find the location of our enemy in these three areas of the human personality etair vimohayatyesha jnanam avartya dehinam these three focal points in the human system senses manas buddhi these evils 
overcome these three aspects of the personality and then delude man avartya says just enveloping the sensory system manas and the buddhi and this man becomes deluded etar vimoheti deluding without delusion you don't do anything wrong when you are in clear thinking you never do wrong when you do wrong there is a delusion behind you that deluded mind alone can do wrong that delusion comes from this and they this it belongs to these three aspects of the human personality so the external is the indriya in the innermost is buddhi in between is manas in the kathop upanishad the yama had told nachiketa life is a journey to fulfillment every human being has been equipped properly for this journey what do you want for a journey you want a chariot you want horses you want reins you want a driver then you can have a beautiful journey nature has given you all this equipment body is a chariot sensory system are the horses motive power of journey is in the horses not the chariot so here is the sensory system full of energy then to control the sensory system is the manas like the reins to control the horses and the reins are held by the chariot here the driver that is buddhi buddhin to sarathin vidhi yama said there buddhi is the chariot here he regulates the journey and yama warned us that this journey if it is to take us to our destination must take one particular wisdom with the with you let not the journey be controlled by the sensory system namely the horses nor by the reins the manas journey must be controlled by the buddhi the driver the arete here these are all energies controlled and directed by buddhi but if each one of them become infected it becomes infected buddhi also becomes infected then you never reach the end of your journey you will suffer shipwreck in your journey he had said that in the katha upanishad that idea he is taken here now here is the beautiful human system the sensory system this sensory system converts this human body into a center of the most dynamic activity in the whole of nature this nervous system and the brain what tremendous energy is going on there but we have to guide that energy discipline that energy direct it to higher purposes that is why your effort comes in if you don't do so this energy will be lost in self cancelling activities a cancels b b cancels a you remain where you are or go down therefore there is need for handling the whole energy system within yourself energy controlled disciplined directed increases in quantity and quality we can see it in ordinary physical energy also a disciplined energy is greater in quality and quantity the war waterfall shows us tremendous energy of water and it goes away wasted all the time but as soon as you control that energy divert it into hydraulic channels and irrigation channels you get power you get agriculture everything therefore in this human system this sensory system is the center of tremendous energy but energy without direction just energy that's all there comes the manas the first instrument to hold together all these energies coordinating all the five senses is the manas it also is like a sensory system but slightly subtle with the capacity to control this energy of the horses like the reins a tough rein is needed to control a very reckless horse so let the senses be reckless 
We don't mind it. That's why we say young people have very strong sensory energy. As you grow older, sensory energy becomes weaker and weaker. But when you are young, these senses are very powerful. Just like a young, beautiful horse, very strong, tremendous energy, we need it. But don't let it be alone. Try tie a reins to the horse. Then only you can carry that energy in the directions which you consider worthy. Otherwise it will be horse's own energy. It is horse's own journey, not your journey. Like the river water flowing down, go into the sea, plenty of energy, but nothing comes out of it. So here also it is the same story. He will say that later on. This discipline of three sources of energy, Indriya, Manas and Buddhi. Manas is what helps us to coordinate the sensory system. And Buddhi is the one that regulates and directs all this energy. Buddhi must be sound. Sound Buddhi. You don't entrust your journey to a drunken driver of a motor car. You are sure to break down on the way, lose your life on the way. Buddhi must be perfectly calm and steady. That is the greatest purpose of education. How to make this Buddhi balanced, discriminative, clear thinking, then life gets the best guidance. Buddhi is the guide of human life. Krishna will tell you in the other chapters, Buddha Sharanam and Vichya. Second chapter he had said, again he will say, develop Buddhi, develop Buddhi, which can restrain and guide all this energy within you. If not, they run helter-skelter, ruin your life, ruin society as well. More of violence, more of crime increasing all over India today, all over the world today, because they have not done anything in this particular field. We don't like even to restrain anything. Let us live at our impulse level, at our sensory level. Let us give it free reign. That is the philosophy by which most people live. When I spoke in America, I spoke a little about this need for discipline of the energies within the human system. I was speaking at the Portland radio, night 10 o'clock. A 20 minutes radio program, originally fixed, became a two-hour program because the man found it very interesting. You continue, Swamiji, if you are not tired, and 20 minutes became two hours with questions coming from audience through telephone. I am answering that. This happened 1969. There, when I said the word discipline in the beginning, the one who was questioning me, interviewing me, modern young man, he said, Oh Swami, he told into the radio, we don't believe in all this discipline. We believe in what you call impulse, free impulse living. We don't believe in all this discipline. He said it with such a gusto, thinking that is the philosophy by which people live today. So I gently said, yes, I also accept that we should have that kind of spontaneous, natural life, no nature of discipline. But if you want to get that state, you must pass through discipline. Some little discipline is essential. I said, first 10 minutes, this talk is going on. Slowly, 15, going to be nearly 20 at this time. Then I told him, you admire Pandit Ravishankar's music. How natural. How spontaneous, what beautiful music it is. Wonderful. But did you ever stop to think and ask one question? That behind this spontaneity of his music lies years of discipline and struggle? He was simply surprised. He said, this is a wonderful idea. I have not heard about it. Then I also added, you see a cow or a dog on the street, passing urine or stools, wherever they like, they have no discipline at all. But every human child is given some toilet discipline. Don't you think so? He shouted into the radio. 
something wonderful. I never thought it that way at all. Listen to this Swami from India. Can you speak longer? Can you continue? I said, yes, I am ready. Up to 12 o'clock it continued. It's a new idea that we accept natural, spontaneous life is the best. But you won't get it without passing through the hell of discipline. Otherwise it will be animal, nature and nothing else. Then I quoted a verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam where it is said that any spontaneous expression of energy can have two dimensions. One is the animal dimension, one is the higher dimension of a person beyond the category of human limitation. A Paramahamsa, a sage, he is natural. The ordinary man also is natural, spontaneous. In between, people are there in varying degrees of tension and struggle dealing with their psychic energy. That's what we are. So, we accept this idea of being natural, spontaneous, but there is something relevant to the human situation. It's not the animal situation. We pass through the struggle. We discipline the energies of the sensory system through the help of manas and buddhi. Then we come to a second type of naturalness. That is a real naturalness. A naturalness of a Ramana Maharshi, for example. Everything is natural, spontaneous. A Sri Ramakrishna, natural, spontaneous. And American youths at that time, at the time of the hippie movement, they were eager to have this naturalness. No more of tension, no more of discipline. We don't like all this. Perfectly right. But if you want to get the true type of naturalness, you have to pass through this hell of a struggle. Without that, you won't get true naturalness capable of raising man to the highest level. You remember that hippie moment, without getting this guidance, slowly gravitated towards crime, evil, drug, this and that. A few only could go higher and higher with a better understanding. So, here is the teaching coming from Krishna. What they told me in America, we like a philosophy called impulse release philosophy. A wonderful expression. Impulse release philosophy. We don't want to control any impulse. Check any impulse. Just release, just release. We will convert human society into animal farm. I said, impulses are not meant to be released, all of them. You have to discriminate which is worth releasing, not. But when you become truly spiritually strong, then you can release all impulses because they will always be pure, coming from depth of the human spirit, not at the, from the lower level, not from the toxic level. That is the background of these beautiful ideas Krishna is conveying to us on this most important problem of civil peace in society. Unless there is peace, how can we enjoy human life? Unless I can trust you, how can I enjoy my life and how can you enjoy your life? That comes from this training of the raw energies that are within us, chasten them, purify them, transform them into something better and better. Socialization is a great word in sociology. A human child is to be socialized, fit to be a member of a community with a capacity to dig affections in each other. That comes from discipline of this raw human energy system. If you don't do so, you will have a society with increasing numbers of criminals and disjointed people, mentally distorted, and that distortion will raise society also becomes distorted. You don't want that kind of society. Today it is so. You have to change it. It is in this context these verses become of supreme significance to modern humanity. It says, Etair vimohayatyesha jnanam avartya dehinam The jnana is hidden by these forces in manas, buddhi and indriya. And then this man is made to do all sorts of evil in society. 
that should not be. So three locations have been shown to us, Indriya, Manas and Buddhi. The next verse is wonderful. Next two, three verses, such insight into the human system, depth psychology as we call it, nowhere else you will find this kind of a deep study of the human system and light being thrown on man's life going in the direction of fullest manifestation of possibilities even within. So he says here, therefore, Krishna says, Tasmat, Tum Indriyanyado, Niyamya Bhardarshabha, Papmanam Pradhikishenam, Jnana Vijnana Nashanam. Therefore, Arjuna, first discipline the sensory system. That is the doorway through which all infection comes. Just wonderful idea. Where from infection entered my body? You must find out. A medical doctor will ask that question. Then try to stop that source of infection. So here, psychically, infection doesn't come from buddhi. It comes from the sensory system. Therefore, regulate the sensory energy system. Discipline them. Tasmatam indriyan yadav. Niyam nya. Regulate and discipline the sensory energy is first, adav, first. Then, papmanam prajagikshenam. This papmanam, this sinner, this criminal that is within you, overcome it through that method. I won't allow any infection to enter into me through the doorway called sensory energy. I shall regulate them. I shall discipline them. That's the language. Papmanam prajagikshenam. This source of papa or crime or sin, overcome it by disciplining energy at the sensory level. What is that evil or infection that enters through the sensory system? Jnana vijnana nashanam, that which destroys eventually your jnana and vijnana. That infection slowly enters into you through the sensory system. You didn't take care of it. It went on increasing. Just like in our cancer, a few cells, cancer cells, get in and develop, and they multiply. They multiply until the whole body, the blood becomes full of cancer cells, and you are gone. Here also the same story. Jnana, Vijnana, Nashanam. All the knowledge that you have, all the wisdom that you have, they become slowly eroded by a loving disinfection to get into you through the doorway of the sensory system. That's the language of this sloga. Tasmatvam Indriyanyadavu Niyamya Bhardarshabha Jivesh Papmanam Pradhyenam Conquer this evil, this infection, this crime-prone energy in you. Papmanam Pradhyahi Conquer is the word. Enam, this, pointing it out, it is so palpable. Just like in physical body, we have infection. We can isolate that infection. Examine the blood, examine the stools, examine the urine, you isolate, this is the infection there. Psychic system also the same. Enam, with such clear, what you call demonstrative pronoun. This, this, well known, evil that is there. Your sensory system has become defective. It has become poisoned. It has become toxic. Take care. From there, everything starts. There's warning that is given by Krishna. Jnana, Vijnana, Nashana. Destroyer of Jnana and Vijnana. Then comes a beautiful study of the dimensions of the human personality. We must know what are the dimensions of this human individual system. This is a wonderful study in the Upanishads. Also here in this chapter of the Gita. This sloka is only one here. It will be two in the Upanishads. But this one is a very beautiful summary 
of the whole description of the dimensions of the human personality. Take for example our skin. Skin itself has so many layers. Then within the skin you begin to see the flesh. Then the veins and the arteries. Then you have the nerves that are going there. Then the bony system. Within the bone you have the marrow. So you can see within the physical system one inside the other. Similarly taking man as a whole our Upanishads made a study. The Taitri of Upanishad is a special study of this subject. They called it the Koshas. Five Koshas are there. Kosha means a sheath. Put a sword in a sheath. That sheath is called a Kosha. Here is the self. That self is sheathed in five sheaths, not just one, being with the body. Annamaya Kosha. Then Prana Maya Kosha, Prana energy, Bio energy, Mano Maya Kosha, psychic energy. Then Buddhi, Vijnana Maya Kosha. And lastly, Ananda Maya Kosha. These are the five Koshas inside which is your true self, hidden in all of them. It is good to know this truth. So here we are taking three of these Koshas here. First is the Indriyas, the sensory system, bioenergy system. Indriyani Paranyahuhu. These Indriyas are very high in quality compared to the body, which is a dull, dead piece of matter. What makes it alive are these sensory energies. They are certainly superior, para, compared to this body or the matter that is outside. The word para is used. Para means higher, superior. That's the meaning of the word para. Indiyani paranyahu. Compared to the dull dead body, Indriyas are superior, are higher. It is Indriyas that make the body a live organism. So Indriyani paranyahu. The word para is used with regard to the Indriyas. Indriyabhya param manaha. Manas is superior, higher, compared to the sensory system. And then, manasastu para buddhi. Superior to, higher than the manas is buddhi. So you can see, gradation, ordinary, higher, still higher. So these are the word three para, word used regarding these three. Then, what is beyond the buddhi? Only one truth is beyond the buddhi. What is that? The Atman, the infinite self. Yo buddhe paradasto saha, who is beyond the buddhi, higher than the buddhi, is he, the infinite Atman, your true self, hidden by all these three sheaths that are there. This is a great subject of utmost significance to man in this age of our civilization. We know so much about the world. We know so much about things that are there, what is hidden in the heart of matter. We know all of them. We know so little of the mind of man, the inner nature of man. Even that Julian Huxley himself said, we have known so little of the human mind. We have only scratched the surface of the mind, surface of the subject. Whereas in Vedanta, it has penetrated deep into this subject. So, what we know of matter from surface to depth, we shall retain. That's a wonderful knowledge. But it must be complemented, sustained and strengthened by this other knowledge. What the depth of the human spirit? What are the coverings of that wonderful spiritual nature? If that knowledge also comes, we shall have a wonderfully stable, rich civilization where quantity is the criterion today in civilization. Quality will become the criterion when this knowledge comes to us and that is the direction of today's science and even the civilizational process itself. That's why Vedanta is so relevant to human beings today 
in both East and West. This subject is so important. I shall continue this subject along with the remaining two, three verses next Sunday when we meet here for this Gita discourse. It is a subject of tremendous significance. I have seen people in the Western countries sitting with the utmost interest to understand this subject. We know so little about it. We want to know more about it. As Huxley said, it's true. We have only scratched the surface of this subject so far. But here is a philosophy that has gone deep into it. The insights and wisdom of that philosophy is highly necessary today for man's facing problems in this 20th century. We shall meet next Sunday, spend a minute in silence and then disperse.